grace to you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon Hill? How are you doing today? Good, man. Thanks for coming out and joining us for worship this morning. If this is your first time at Beacon Hill, I pray that you have been welcomed already by our Beacon Hill family. If I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, please stop by. I'd love to get a chance to meet you and just thank you and pray with you after service. I'll be hanging out down here. Uh, Beacon Hill is a church that uh, desires strongly to shine the light of Christ into all places of Hopewell and beyond. If there is a place that um, is especially dark, we want to go shine the light of Christ in those places. We believe that the answer to the darkness in this town is not in more programs, but in more Jesus. Not in more bureaucracy, but in more Jesus. And we believe that we must put feet to our faith and shine the light of Jesus here in Hopewell and beyond. And it's that Jesus I want to preach today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Open them up with me to Matthew chapter 4. We'll be studying verses 1 through 11 this morning. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand, and one of our Beacon Hill team members will bring you a copy of God's Word for you to follow along. We believe strongly in having the Word open as it is preached. Don't be bashful to raise your hand. They're free. We're not going to charge you until next week for them. Look, all right, we believe strongly in having the Word open as it is preached. I want you to see uh, where I'm getting what I'm preaching. I'd also like to welcome our online viewers. Uh, every week we have Mike and Claire Kosick that get us online. We thank you for your dedication. And we have Ben Wright, who's our online deacon, moderating for any questions or prayer concerns that you may have. So thank you and welcome to those who are watching online from here to Haiti and into the Philippines. We are thank you for um, each and every person. Right now, as is custom at Beacon Hill, if you're able, we invite you to stand in honor of reading God's word. Matthew chapter 4. Verses 1 through 11. If you're new here, I read out of the CSB translation. The Word of God says this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Then the tempter approached him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. He answered, It is written, Man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus told him, It is also written, Do not test the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you'll just fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him and the angels came and began to serve him. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for today. We thank you for every soul that is in here. Lord, we thank you for your word to guide us, protect us, and deliver us. Lord, um, you didn't call us to be comfortable. You called us to abandon everything and follow you. And when we do that, um, the devil's not going to be happy. And so, Lord, as we study your word this morning, may you speak to each person in here. Lord, that the Holy Spirit just works on their hearts And Lord, if someone is here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, I thank you uh, for the blessing of being able to serve you. May we never forget that. May we never take that for granted. Lord, you could have chosen any ways to redeem a lost and broken world, and you chose to use us as your plan A. Lord, I thank you for that privilege. And so, Lord, as we go out and as we share your message of reconciliation, Lord, may we remember who it's all about and who it's all for. May we continue to decrease and you continue to increase and people know your name here in the well and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I've entitled uh, today's message, Going Toe-to-Toe with the Devil going toe-to-toe with the devil. Anybody ever been uh, toe-to-toe with the devil? 
You've, uh, you feel like your whole life sometimes is going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. This is about as important as a message that I can preach. Because if we're going to be a church that shines the light into darkness, we are going to have to get used to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. If we're going to continue to, to push into the darkest areas of the well, we are going to have to get used to going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. And I pray this message doesn't discourage you today, but it encourages you that there is victory to be won over the devil. Sometimes it feels like the devil is winning. Does it feel like that to you sometimes? Does it feel like the devil is complete authority and in charge with all the hatred and all that we see around us? And I think about when we look at this, this message today and, and the scripture that God has given us, I think that sometimes we need to step back and learn why and how to fight the devil. Because sometimes I believe we're using the wrong tools, church. We're relying on ourselves and not on Jesus. So I want to start with some, so just some truths, just some truths in here today. The first truth is this, is that Jesus is real and the devil is real, church. That is the number one truth that I want to share with you today. I know the devil is real because I've done business with him. And I know Jesus is real because I talk to him every day. Secondly, it is impossible for Jesus to tell a lie, and, and it is impossible for the devil to tell the truth. Thirdly, if you serve Jesus, you are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. And lastly, to encourage you, the same tools that Jesus used to fight off the devil are the same exact tools that are available to us to fight him off as well. So let's learn as a church the schemes of the devil and how to fight the devil this morning. There's two points I, I want to pull out of this first two verses. One is the devil is going to hit you when you are most vulnerable. The devil's going to come after you when you are most vulnerable, church. The Bible says that the devil seeks an opportune time. And that opportune time is when you're either least able to fight off the devil or least expecting the devil to come after you. In this text, the devil came after Jesus at the most opportune time of his life of his life. The devil came after Jesus right after the highest of the highs when he was baptized and the spirit rest upon him and the heavens opened and he heard the words from the father, uh, that is my son with whom I am well pleased. He went from that spiritual high in his life to being weak from fasting 40 days in the wilderness. He had the two extremes of his life going on at the exact same time. And if there was ever a time that the devil thought that he could knock out Jesus, it was going to be at this moment. You know, the same goes for us, church. You know, the devil will hit us in some of the best times of our life. You ever have a moment in your life where you're fine, when you feel like you can finally breathe, you, you finally feel like, man, this is what I've been working for. This is, this, this is good. This feels good. And then something comes along to just pull the rug right out from you. It just hits you in an instant. You're like, why is this happening to me? Your, your life is literally flipped upside down. Has anybody been like that and had a moment in their lives? And, you know, and sometimes we take it out on people because it's people who we can see. It's people who cause us hurts, and, and we take it out on, on people when the Bible says that it's not against flesh and blood, but it's against the principalities of darkness. The devil doesn't want you to be happy. See, see, we look at this. The devil uses people to try to rob you of your joy in Christ. See, why does the devil try to hit you in the most highs of your life? One, he doesn't want you to be happy in Christ Jesus. He doesn't want you to be happy following the Lord. And it's also in those times that the devil chooses to hit you 
Because in the good times of your life are the times where you're tempted to rely on yourself more and on God less. You've heard me quote D.L. Moody where he says, we can handle affliction better than we can prosperity. Because in times of prosperity, we tend to forget God. When things are going well in our life, we start to take God for granted. We, we, we start attending church less. We start reading the Bible less frequently. And the devil is like, I'm about to rock their world right now. Because they're taking their hands off of Jesus. They think that they can get through the day. Every, every, you know, you feel like that sometimes in your life and, and then the devil comes after you. You know, it's not like we should be paranoid when things are going well in our life. I mean, I've been honest about my anxiety. Sometimes when, when things are going well in my life, I'm like, oh, where's he at? Where's he at? He's going to knock me down. It's not that we should be paranoid in those times of life. It's in times of our life when things are going well that we should see God even more. We should thank God even more. We should praise God even more in times of our life when things are going well. But here's the flip side. The devil will also hit you in the weakest moments of your life. When you think you can't take any more, the devil's going to come and hit you with one last knockout punch. It's in those times that the devil thinks if he hits you again, you will finally say, heck with Jesus, I'm going back to my life before Jesus when I didn't have as much problems. I'm speaking from experience here, folks. I, I, I've got the t-shirt and it's not fun. I, I felt like I've gone 12 rounds with Mike Tyson in his prime, and nobody has gone 12 rounds with Mike Tyson in his prime. And then Muhammad Ali comes and hits me with his best punch in his prime. The devil hits you because he wants you to come back to him. But be encouraged this morning. Nothing, nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hand. Nothing can snatch you out of the Father's hands. As a matter of fact, when you come to Christ, when you give your, and I'm talking to you today, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, and if you're tired of fighting your battles on your own, repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ today. It will be the best day of your life, and you will never regret it. Because once you are in Christ, there is never a day for the rest of your life that you're without Christ. Once you're in Christ, you're never without him. So the devil's going to hit you when you're most vulnerable. But secondly, church, the devil's also going to hit you when you step up for Jesus. The devil's going to hit you when you step up. It should not be a surprise that the devil came after Jesus at this moment in time. Because it was at this time that God chose for Jesus to start his three-year public ministry. It would be the ministry that would set in motion God's redemptive and reproductive plan that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life, church. It was a ministry that would reconcile a lost and broken world with an unbreakable savior. The devil thought, if I can take him out now, if I can take him out now, then everything will be mine. He came swinging. He came swinging hard to knock out Jesus before Jesus would knock him out. We are not a feel-good preaching church here. If this is your first time here, we are, we are not a feel-good preaching church. You didn't come to the wrong place if you want a feel-good prosperity church. We don't teach only the happy things in the Bible. We teach the whole counsel of God's word. We don't want you to be uninformed of what is going to happen when you serve Jesus. We celebrate baptisms because baptisms are the greatest miracle that Jesus does today. He takes people who were dead in their trespasses and makes them alive in Christ Jesus. And if you can't get excited and celebrate somebody's new life in Christ, you're not in Christ either, church. We should celebrate when God does amazing things. It's a miracle. I love celebrating baptisms, but if you've ever been baptized by me here at this church, and I don't do a ton of baptisms myself anymore, 
butt and my knees are bad. I can't, but, but if I've ever baptized you, chances are you have heard me say before we dunk you and we pray over you that your life is about to suck. That's really uplifting, isn't it? I mean, that, that's, that's real uplifting. Congratulations of your new life in Christ. It's going to get real crappy for you from here on out, right? Why? Because you're taking a huge step in your life, and the devil can't stand it. He wants you back, and he knows he can't get you back. And so he doesn't want you to enjoy some of the best moments in your life. He can't stand it because he has lost another one who is now a child of God. And he will throw a temper tantrum, and he will often throw a temper tantrum at the ones who just come to Christ. He knows there's nothing that he can do about it. And I hate to tell you this. The devil won't go away after one punch. He won't give up. Every time... Every time that you take a step up for Jesus, the devil will take a step at attacking you. And the more that you step up for Jesus, the greater the intensity of the attacks. I could spend the rest of the sermon giving example after example in my own life how the devil has come after our family in different ways. And I'm sure many of you have stories in here that you could share as well. If you're hearing this, or you're new to church, and thinking about stepping up for Jesus, you're probably not very encouraged at this moment, are you? You're probably saying, why would I possibly want to step up for Jesus? And I hate to be a killjoy. This goes back to not being a feel-good church. We just try to preach the truth here. You're either serving Jesus, or you're serving the devil. There's no in-between. So you have to make a choice today. Are you going to serve Jesus or are you going to serve the devil? There's no in between. You cannot be a sideline Christian church. You're either all in or you're all out. What is your choice this morning? Are you all in for Jesus? Are you all in for Jesus? Because look, it's actually a pretty cool thing when the devil comes after you because you are identifying with Christ Jesus himself and there's nothing more cool than being more like Jesus, church. And if you've ever been hit by the devil, it's likely because, if you've ever been hit by the devil, it's likely because you're making steps in your life towards Jesus. And if you've never been hit by the devil, if you've never gone through spiritual warfare in your life, it's likely because you all are on the same team. So therefore, there's really no option in your life. You just kind of got to get used to spiritual warfare. Because I would rather serve Jesus than Satan any day. So not only do we have to learn that, that Satan will come after us when we're most vulnerable and we need to step up for Jesus, when, and that's times that the devil will come after us, so that's, that's good information, right? But we need to learn how to, the, the tax that the devil will come after us, how, how he'll try to manipulate and how he'll try to come after us. And so once we learn that, we can learn how to fight him. And so verses 3 through 10 shows that the devil has a wide variety of a bag of tricks that he will use to come after you. He will go after your provisions, your manipulation, and use power. And so we see in verses 3 through 4 where he tries to attack provisions first. He goes, then the tempter approached him and said, if you are the son of God, tell the stones to become bread. And he answered, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan knew that Jesus was hungry. He knew that he had been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He, he knew he was hungry, and he knew that, that he, he could tempt him to turn these stones into bread. But you know that Jesus never acted independently of the Father's will. Could Jesus have turned the stones to bread? Absolutely, he could have done that. He could have done anything he wanted, but he was dependent on the Father, and he wanted to honor the Father in everything in his life. So he told Satan that, that man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, quite frankly, we look at this and we go, how does this relate to us? This is the, one of the areas that we struggle with in our own life. 
You know, we often put our physical needs ahead of our spiritual needs. You know, when we do that, we sin. Jesus said, if I take care of the birds of the air, how much more will I take care of you? You know, when we allow the circumstances around us to dictate our actions, we, we, we sin. And we've talked about this over the past couple of years because COVID-19 has really shown us a lot about who we put as a priority in our life. When we're scared, like we're not going to have enough, we say, y'all toilet paper hoarding freaks in here. <laughs> My wife was one of them. We just ran out of three years of toilet paper supply that she bought in the first thing, right? The reason Food Line didn't have any toilet paper because it was at the Moore's house, all right? When gas shortage, how many of you run to gas to fill up and get and fill it up? Think about it. Just, just think about when we hear the news of, of what might be happening, y'all freaked out about a balloon being popped out of the air in Myrtle Beach yesterday. Think about it. How quickly we are to listen to the world instead of listening to the word. The devil will try to hit you with provisions and say, man, you better do this. You better not give to church because you're, you're going to, you know, a recession's coming. The devil will try to hit you with, with things that you, you, you value most. And that is one is like, how am I going to eat today? And you know what? We learn so much from our unsheltered population here. We learn so much from our unsheltered population. When we try to give out extra food to our unsheltered, they will often say to us, oh, I've got enough for today. Just give it to somebody else who needs it more. And I'm like, you don't even know where your next meal is coming from, and you want us to give it to somebody else? It says somebody else needs it more than I do. We can learn about a lot about trusting God from our unsheltered. But secondly, we see the devil works through manipulation in verses 5 through 7. It says, and the devil took him to the holy city, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will give his angels orders concerning you and they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against that stone. And Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. You know, a lot of times we think like, okay, I've gone through one battle with the devil. I've gone through one hit. And we're foolish to think that the devil is going to go away after just one hit. If the devil hits you, you better be ready for the backup punch because he's coming again, church. And so we see this when he comes after Jesus. He's hitting him with manipulation of God's word. He gets, not only does he up the ante, he gets more deceptive. And do you know that the devil knows God's word? The devil knows God's word more than the people of God know God's word. And he can twist God's word. And a lot of times he uses people in pulpits today to twist his word and pull people away from God. If you don't know the word of God, you don't know that you're being pulled away from the word of God. The devil left out an important part of scripture. And he didn't fight him. Jesus didn't fight him. He didn't go, no, you actually did this. You did this. You should have done this. He said, it is written, you don't test Lord, your God. You know, you can prove almost anything in the Bible if you take it out of context. You can prove anything that you want in your life if you take God's word out of context. So know what God's means. Know what his word means. Because I can tell you this today, that God will never call you to do something that is contrary to his word. God will never do that. So the devil will use manipulation, but he'll also try to entice you with power, verses 8 through 10. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and in the splendor. And he said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus told him, go away, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Here's something that a lot of people have a hard time with. Do you know that Satan is the ruler of this world right now? I mean, Satan can do nothing outside of God allowing him to do it. But Satan is the ruler of this world. It says that in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. If you're saying, preacher, I don't, I don't never heard this. Look at God's word, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The devil having twice, twice, tried twice to get Jesus to fall, came after him with the most tempting of all. Jesus knew what awaited him. Jesus knew that he would suffer and have to give his life up on the cross 
before he would be uh, exalted at the right hand of the Father. And the devil's like, look, I'm going to give you a shortcut, a way that you don't have to go through everything that your Father is telling you to do. Since I'm the role of the world, I'm going to give you everything if you will just bow down, bow down one time and worship me. See, so the devil finally tipped his hat. The devil finally tipped his hat and really, really wants what the devil wants is for you to worship him. What the devil wants is for Jesus to worship him. But the devil will never get victory because there's only one person worthy of worship and his name is Jesus Christ Church. So look, when you think about him trying to entice Jesus with, with a shortcut to power, I, I can't tell you example after example how so many pastors fall into this trap every single year. You know, we, a lot of pastors, they, they start off churches like we did, out of a living room. And then they get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what eventually happens, people start telling the pastor how great they are. Not at this church. Y'all are good at keeping me humble. <laughs> but, but, but people will start to tell the pastor how great they are. And then the devil puts it in their minds and they start to believe it. And then they take their hands off of Jesus and then you see, you see churches, pastors fall, and churches fall right behind them. It's so important that if Jesus didn't take shortcuts to the cross, neither can we, church. So the question is, how do we, how do we fight this? I mean, the devil is so tricky, so manipulative. How can we fight the devil? And I'm glad you asked. I mean, because you sit there and go, look, this is great stuff. I see how Jesus did this, but how do we do it? Because we're just mere mortal people. How can we possibly fight the devil? I'm glad you asked that question because we can fight the devil the same way that Jesus fought the devil. The same tools that were available to Jesus are available to us as well. The first thing that we see that we can fight the devil with is the Spirit of God. See, Jesus was full of, uh, of uh, fully man and fully divine on his time on earth. And he never acted independently of the Father's will. He didn't say, look, I'm Jesus. I can do this on my own. And if you go back to last week's text, if you just flip back and you have your Bibles open, which you should, you flip back and see that after he was baptized, the Spirit of God, like a dove, rested on his shoulder. Do you see that? Remember that? And he trusted the Spirit who led him into the wilderness to guide him on how to fight the devil. Here's a great truth today, is that once you are in Christ, and I said you're never without Christ, the reason that is is because the Holy Spirit comes and lives with inside of you. The Holy Spirit lives with inside of each and every single believer in here today. Isn't that encouraging, church? Like we have God living inside of us. Now, some of you are like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand this. And, and if you've never understood about what the Holy Spirit does in your life, I encourage you to do Francis Chan's For God and God Bible Study to learn all about what the Holy Spirit can do in your life and then learn how to use the Holy Spirit in your life, church. Look. Because i got to tell you, if you're not understanding how the Holy Spirit works in your life, when the devil attacks you, you're not going to have a chance to Google it. The devil is going to come after you. So not only do you have the Spirit of God to fight off the devil, but you have the Word of God to fight off the devil. Did you notice this? And, you know, I kind of skipped over this because I was going to come back to it. Did you notice how Jesus fought off the devil at every turn? Every time the devil hit Jesus with the temptation, Jesus hit the devil with the word of God. He says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus didn't get into war of words with him. No, he hit the devil with the word of God. He said, it is written, man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil didn't go away after one tip. He came back and decided to hit him with the word of God and twist the word of God and take the word of God out of context. 
He says, look, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will give his angels orders concerning you. And they will support you with their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus responded saying, it is written. It is also written. Do not test the Lord your God. Surely the devil is going to stop coming after Jesus after two times because he knows Jesus knows the word of God. But yet the devil came with his hardest punch next. He says, look, you ever feel like you, you can't take any more? You've been punched and you punch and you're down to one knee and the devil hits you over and over again. You ever feel like that, church? Surely it's going to stop. And the devil took him to this very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all the splendor. And he goes, look, I'll give you everything. I'll give you all this if you just bow down and worship me. And Jesus looked at him and says, go away, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Satan finally went away and the angels ministered to Jesus. But Satan didn't go away forever. And you know, when you go through punches of Satan and he attacks you and he hits you, I hate to tell you, the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you, which is truth. But it's also truth that the the devil won't leave you forever. The devil is going to go back and regroup and try to hit you a different way in a different time. But I've got encouragement for you this morning. That when the devil comes after you, and the devil will come after you, you can have victory over the devil by hitting him with the word of God, church. When the devil tells you you are not good enough, then you can hit him with the word of God that says, in Christ Jesus, I am good enough. When the devil tells you that your children are gone and never going to come back, you can hit them with the word of God that says, train up a child in the way that they should go and they will not depart. When the devil says, I don't care about you, that Jesus doesn't care about you, you can hit him with the word of God from Matthew 28, 20, where it says Jesus will be with you always to the ends of the ages. And not only did Jesus care about me, he died for me. He gave his life for me. He forgave me for my inequities, church. I don't know about you, but that's the most glorious thing that we can ever hold on to. So when the devil tells you that you can't be forgiven for the things that you've done in your life, hit him with the word of God. Hit him, hit him, hit him, hit him with the word of God, church. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for today. We thank you for being a God who loves us and never leaves us and never forsakes us. Lord, I'm tired sometimes and, and I don't feel like I can possibly get up anymore. And Lord, I know that Satan wants to try to knock me out. But I know this from the word of God. is greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Hit him. Hit him with the word of God. The devil has no place in this church. The devil has no place in your life. The devil has no place in, in your families. The devil has no place in five forks. Hit him with the word of God and flip this town upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this time of response. Lord, we would humble ourselves and admit that we can't fight the devil on our own. We don't need some of Jesus. We need all of Jesus. So Lord, whatever battles that we're fighting today, let's take it to Jesus and let him fight our battles for us. Lord, I pray that if someone is in here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, that this time response will be the time where they give their life to you. Lord, this is a time where, where it's all about you and it's all for you. Let's stand and respond to the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen.